Welcome to the World on Fire podcast. I am your host, as always, historian and researcher Nick Schweitzer. As a fair warning for this episode, the biography of Witold Pileski is incredibly short, as we will learn. However, the things this man would endure and experience in the Second World War on a quite literal voluntary basis is one of the greatest sacrifices known to man. This episode is going to be dark, and I will fair warn you that it does not have a good ending. As we will find out, not only did Pileski volunteer to go to Auschwitz concentration camp, but he would later be turned on and quite literally defamed. But that's for the main episode, right? So let's talk about what is happening this week in 1944. So on May 6th, Soviet forces launched their final assault to break the lines of Sevastopol with an insane amount of men, and they would be successful. The following day, 1,500 bombers from the famed U.S. 8th Air Force would take to the skies over Berlin, causing devastation to the heart of the German people. On the 8th, the Czech government that is currently in exile in England signs a convention allowing the Soviet Union to liberate their nation. In today's day, in the midst of fighting at Sevastopol, Soviet Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky is nearly killed by a road mine. And tomorrow, on the 11th, Allied forces would launch Operation Datum, breaking the German lines in the Leary Valley in Italy. What makes tomorrow more special is the deception attack at the Calas in France that would be placed pulling Axis eyes away from Normandy and ultimately setting the stage for the liberation of Europe. Also, just like last week, there are a shit ton of U-boats that are getting sent to the ocean floor across the Atlantic. Now, with that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and just get the episode started. There's a lot of awful things that we're going to cover in this episode, a lot of human suffering and unspeakable conditions. So let's take a Take it back to one singular man, crossing a gate that reads only, I bet Mike Fry, voluntarily into a world of pure hell. This is the biography of the man who went to Auschwitz on purpose. This is Witold Pileski. Born on May 13th, 1901, that would be a happy 123rd birthday this coming Monday, in Olnets of the Russian Empire to Julian and Ludwika Pileski. Uh, now, unlike most of the biographies that we have covered and most likely will cover, this one's rather unique for a multitude of reasons. Most of the bios that we have done when it comes to these military leaders would be be that they have come from some form of strong lineage of soldiers and leaders, almost as if they were a higher caste in their societies. But for Pileski, this would be very different. You see, Witzold's grandfather, Yosef, was a member of the anti-Russian group in the 1860s and would participate in the January Uprising in 1865. Because of this, Yosef and his entire family would be exiled to Siberia for nearly a decade as punishment for crimes against the throne. Now, what exactly does this mean for Witzold? It means that everything prior to his birth has been completely stripped from his family. By the time he would be born, his father would be working in manual labor and the family would ultimately struggle. Now, it's important to note here that while Pileskis were from the Russian Empire, Their lineage dates back much further to a Polish foundation. This was important to the family, and so much so that in 1911, when Witzold was 10, his mother would move him and his four siblings to Vilnius in Lithuania to attend a Polish school there. While this is taking place, his father does not leave their home city of Olenets, and it is here in Vilnius that Witzold would begin to feel the urge of Polish patriotism, if you will. Rather quickly, Witold would join a Polish scout movement and was heavily engaged early on as a member. 
for those that you that do not know what the scout movement was, it was basically like a paramilitary organization uh, that seeded their struggles for independence. So before he's even 15 years old, Witzold has already accepted his Polish bloodline, and he is aware that the struggles Poland is having with their independence. This would be further exacerbated by the First World War that would engulf the entire world. So after the beginning of the war in 1914, Ludwika again moved the young Witzold and his siblings back to the Russian Empire, settling in the Mogilev region. Instead of ditching his ideologies, Witzold would set out to start a new chapter of the scout movement in the city of Orel. So right off the bat, even in his adolescence, we're starting to see some rather against-the-grain mentality. And while Witzold would be basically right at the fighting age when the First World War would end, he wouldn't entirely miss out on any of the fighting. You see, immediately following the end of World War I, the Second Polish Republic would successfully declare its independence on November 11, 1918. For Witzold, this meant now that he had an ethnic home that he could not only serve, but return to. As I stated, he missed the fighting in World War I, but he most certainly did not miss the fighting that started on the borders of Poland and now Soviet Union, starting a three-year war between the two nations. Witzel, who had since returned to Vilnius, was a key member of the city's defense forces fighting against the Soviets. Eventually, he would join the 211th Regiment of the Neiman Cavalry and take part in the Battle of Warsaw in 1920. I'd like to call attention really fast that at this point in his life, he is still what we would consider a high school student here in the United States. He's 18 years old, almost 19, and has spent the later part of his teen years fighting against the Soviets and volunteering for the Polish army. Witzold would not go on to graduate his basically his secondary education till the following year in 1921 at the age of 20 years old. So we're talking about a guy who put fighting for his independence over his childhood obligations uh, to not go to school, to not finish school. His obligation in his mind was uh, Polish independence. And he would go on to fight in other skirmishes, such as that of the Polish-Lithuanian War that also took place in 1920, uh, as well as where the Poles would again successfully in their push for independence and building and structuring their borders. It is after this that to Witzold, it was clear that a career in the army could be a, well, a real possibility. Following the end of the Polish-Soviet War, Witzold would accept the rank of corporal in the reserves, ultimately making him a non-commissioned officer before the age of 21. Through the interwar periods, we see a lot of things that sort of redirect Witzold actually away from the army. First being him enrolling in college, uh, where after two years he would be forced to withdraw from his studies due to financial problems stemming from a failing, uh, the failing health of his father and thus returning his focus back to military duties. In 1925, he would be promoted to second lieutenant, officially becoming a commissioned officer and solidifying a career in the army, all the while taking control of his family's estate in the city of Sukhazy. I want to deter away from the main story real quick and talk about this estate. When Witzold took over the estate in 1926, it was in rough shape and borderline getting ready to fail. However, Witzold was able to work and within a few years was able to return the estate into something that could potentially provide generational wealth and securing his family's wealth in the current time. Once again, once he had all this settled, he would turn his attention back to his military career. By the 1930s, Witzold was quickly becoming a leader in the Polish cavalry and, in general, was living a great life. He married his wife Maria in 1931, and they would go on to have two children almost immediately following that. In 1932, he would organize, put together, and train an all-volunteer cavalry regiment in the Lida County in Belarus under the name of Krakus. He would even go on further to be appointed the commander of the 1st Lita Military Training Squadron. His impact to the pre-war Polish army 
was almost immeasurable due to the intricacies in which he worked with. For his actions and commitment to his role within the army, he was awarded the Silver Cross of Merit in 1938. But as we are aware, the change from 1938 to 1939 would be a history-defining time frame, especially for the nation of Poland. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazis would kick off the Second World War with the invasion of Poland, and Pileski was thrown into a hellish nightmare. Fighting in every direction, Pileski and his men were being decimated. On September 22nd, the order was given to retreat out of the country. However, not all men, including Pileski, would follow these orders. They were going to stay in Poland and fight in Poland, or they were going to die. In November, those members that refused the orders to leave Poland founded the secret Polish army. They have now went from being a bona fide military to resistance fighters using guerrilla tactics. Now, I'm going to kind of gloss over some of the next stuff because I know we're itching to him and how he got to Auschwitz. Uh, It's important to understand that the secret Polish army, or TAP, uh, was deeply rooted with religious faith, mainly Christianity. And Pileski was openly not a fan of having the organization be faith-based ideology and was known to have gotten in a few tiffs with higher-ranking members. It's important to note that Pileski was also a very high-ranking member within TAP, so it wasn't like he was a lowly-ranking member just being a pain in the ass. He was a big voice that was heard. With anti-Semitic crimes taking place more and more throughout Poland, TAP was beginning to question the detention camp that had been set up in the town of Oswicine. This camp would be Auschwitz. By this point, little is known about what is taking place in this camp or if any other camps are going on for that matter. But the rumors are swirling that this isn't just merely a detention center at all, but it's a slave labor camp with brutal conditions. And on top of that, murder. It was clear that someone needed to infiltrate the camp and report back. Now, how Pileski or why Pileski was picked by TAP to personally do this mission, um, I don't know. But I can tell you that in his letters, he felt that he was punished for not agreeing to this Christian-backed oath uh, that TAP was pushing. Uh, Was it because of that, or was it because they truly believed that he was the right man for the job? Honestly, we will probably never know. But regardless, Pileski was selected to get himself captured and interned at Auschwitz. On September 19, 1940, under the guise of Tomasz Serfinski, Witold Pileski would purposefully get himself captured by the Nazis. Moving forward in the episode, I'm not going to follow any specific guides of what took place just because it's over cumbersome. Uh, But what I am going to do is I'm going to openly talk about these reports that he would make upon his escape from Auschwitz nearly two and a half years later. It's important to note within Auschwitz that the gassings did not begin until August of 1941. This absolutely does not mean that prisoners were not being killed at this time. They were simply just not being gassed to death. The murders and torture were still very much taking place. And Pileski's job within Auschwitz would be to not only send reports from the camp describing the situation, but he was also there to help formulate and create a resistance group within the camp. Prisoner 4859, as he would now be known, snuck his first report out of the camp a month later after his capture in October of 1940, and it would take the letter nearly five months to reach the Polish government in exile. Five. Within this report proved that the rumors that they were hearing were true. In his first report, Pileski describes a nightmarish situation, speaking of how the Germans are starving people and working them until they die, only to replace them with new prisoners every time. Wash, rinse, repeat. In a following report, he would speak of how after Operation Barbarossa, the Soviet POWs being brought to the camp were being separated for an odd reason and he investigated to find out what were being done with these men. And what he found was that they were being used as human test subjects for medical experiments to include sterilization. 
which in most cases would not only cause the men a great deal of pain, but they would ultimately succumb to their traumas. Each report that Pulaski made became increasingly more and more violent. The Nazis were not blind to the fact that someone or something inside this camp was brewing and getting information out. By 1941, the ZOW, which was the resistance group within Auschwitz, would expand to many members and they would even make a radio that would take them close to seven months to design and build. This now allowed them to communicate without letters. And the signs were showing and people began to talk. The Nazis were now done with this little problem that they were having. In another report, he talks about how any prisoner that is suspected of being a member of the ZOW would be executed immediately. It was clear that an uprising would need to happen or all their efforts would be squandered. While these reports of atrocities are now making their ways to allied hands, the Nazis are hell-bent on stopping whoever it is. The Camp Gestapo is called in to not just investigate, but to eliminate this threat once and for all. Rather quickly, members of the Zhao are being picked off one by one. The Nazis are torturing them to death, and the moment that they name someone else within the organization, they're executed on the spot. At the same time this is taking place, he writes a final and lengthy detailed report that would be smuggled out speaking of these mass murders and gassings. What's interesting about this report is that he also brings to light the systematic murder of not just Jews, but really everyone. He describes disabled people, the elderly, children, Romas, the gypsies, obviously the Jews the Catholics, and so many more. It did not matter. They were being murdered like it produced money. The report would make it out of the camp in January of 1943, but it was now clear to Pileski that if he stayed in this camp any longer, the Gestapo were going to find him, and they were most certainly going to end his life. Witold would escape from Auschwitz concentration camp on the night of April 26, 1943. Two years and seven months since he had volunteered to be captured. Now, upon Pileski's return to Warsaw in June of 1943, he began to write his full and in depth report of not just his experiences at Auschwitz, but everyone else's experience as well. Unfortunately for him, however, this would all be in vain. Neither the Home Army nor the Soviets were interested at all and taking action to free the prisoners. It was simply just not at the forefront of their mission in 1943. And with that, Witzold picked up right where he had left off, rejoining the resistance movement in Poland, and ultimately playing a massive role in the Warsaw Uprising in August of 1944. But as we know, and we'll eventually talk about in a later episode, uh, the Warsaw Uprising would fail, and Witzold Pileski would be captured yet once again. This time, he would avoid a concentration camp and be sent to a Polish POW camp specifically for Polish officers, and that would be O Flag 7 in Murnau, Bavaria. And that is where Witzold would spend the rest of the war until the camp was liberated on April 29, 1945. But for Witzold, the story doesn't really end here, nor does it truly get better. After the war, the occupation of Poland by the Soviet Union became quickly a deteriorating situation. Pileski, who had now joined the Polish military intelligence, would be sent into Poland to report the situation between the occupiers and the occupied. Living under different names and moving frequently, it appeared that Pileski would once again avoid detection. However, in 1946, he discovered that his true identity had been revealed and that the NKVD were on were looking high and low for him. Refusing an immediate order to leave Poland, Pileski was determined to stay and finish the job for the country that he loved so dearly, but it was not just that. He had a wife and children that were still in Poland, and he would not be leaving anymore. On May 8, 1947, Witold Pileski would be captured for the final time in his life by the Soviet Union. 
relentlessly tortured and brutally beaten, quite literally having his fingernails and toenails removed, Pileski never divulged any information that would lead to any others. But it was clear that he was the head of something much bigger, and the show trial put on would last for nearly two weeks. People knew him and loved him were forced to testify against him as an enemy of the state. And on May 18, 1947, Vitold Pileski was found guilty and sentenced to death. He would spend an entire year on death row, for on May 25, 1948, he was executed with a single shot to the back of the head. Vitold Pileski would be rather a, a talked about a non-talked-about figure until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Still to this day, his report is considered the first and one of the most important eyewitness accounts of not just Auschwitz, but for the entire Holocaust. Following the Soviet Union's falling, his rehabilitation would begin. And now today in Poland, Witold Pileski is considered a national hero, and one of the greatest Polish military officers in history. His story should remind us all of how great a sacrifice can truly be. I know this episode was short. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to, I felt like this man's story, especially as we get closer uh, to the, uh, the remembrance holiday of uh, the Holocaust, I feel like his story really is just a driving stake of what these people went through. His report that he wrote in 1943 is massive. I highly suggest all of you take time, read some of it to understand the realities. Because what's so unique is he was writing these reports in real time. So there's real emotion behind it. There's real fear behind it. There's a true sense of just being scared shitless. And so when you go through and you read these, what's most interesting is you'll find out that the allies and even the Soviets felt like at some point he was over-exaggerating. There's no way it can be this bad. No human is going to treat another human this way. But he was right. His stories were not over-exaggerated. What he was telling was the truth. Now, if the allies would have believed him, if that would have made a difference, who knows? But for what it is worth, the things that he did in that time period proved that humans truly were that bad. It proved that the Nazis were really that bad. It proved that these camps were murder factories. So thank you all so much for stopping in for this week's short episode. In our upcoming episode, we're going to start a new series. In our next series, we'll be discussing 2024's biggest World War II production, being Masters of the Air. Every episode, we're going to be covering two episodes from the show. Um, so make sure you go ahead, jump on, watch all the episodes. Uh, that way you know what we're talking about when you come back. I appreciate all of you coming back week after week. Uh, and if you're in the central Midwest near Indiana, uh, be on the lookout as we'll be hosting an 80th anniversary of D-Day event around the Indianapolis area. So just follow us on the social media and you will see that here soon. Uh, thank you. Uh, seriously, again. Uh, make sure you leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast and hit us up on all those social media by searching World on Fire, a history of the Second World War podcast. As always, stay safe and I will talk to you all in two weeks.